first of all, um, thank you all for attending. And um, uh, I, I hope you enjoy um, the two days um, ahead of us. Um, what I thought I'd do is start out with an overview of what we're doing at Scripps. Um, we're really, you know, in light of the changing times and the changing challenges um, that face us, we're asking whether, whether um, there's a new model or a better model for biomedical research institutes as we, we move into the 21st century. One, you know, that not only does what research institutes have historically done well, which is advanced scientific discovery and technology development, but um, one that also accelerates the translation of those discoveries to in innovative new medicines that, that directly impact the public. And, and in doing so, can we actually create a better model for funding science that, that, that's not only self-sustaining, but that, that grows? Um, on, the, on the next slide, um, uh, Scripps is, is one of this country's best kept secrets, um, but despite its small size, it, it, it's really had a, a remarkable impact on science. It was actually um, uh, ranked number one worldwide in terms of its impact on scientific innovation. Um, we have a top 10 graduate program. We've had one since its inception over 20 years ago. And, and we also have an entrepreneurial spirit. Um, we've started over 50 companies and had an impact on commerce, as well as the development of, of new medicines contributing to, to at least 10 FDA approved drugs. Um, some, of the, some of the major advances um, in, in science and biomedical research that have come out of Scripps are in sensory neuroscience, understanding how we feel pain and temperature and, and touch in the molecular basis for the immune response of the humoral, cellular, and innate immune system, and, and synthetic methods, both synthetic biology and, and, and synthetic chemistry methodologies. Um, and, and the development of new technologies for genomics, proteomics, for chemical library synthesis and screening and, and, and vaccine design. And, and I could argue it's in fact the golden, golden age of biology where, where we know more about life science and disease than we've ever known. But despite that knowledge, um, there's still a huge unmet need for new medicines and, and medical technologies, ranging from degenerative diseases of aging as the population ages, we, we see more and more cha challenges with the, the quality of life, um, childhood diseases, all the way to infectious diseases um, like COVID, but also TB and HIV and cancer. And, and, and we, we need to ask, why is that? Um, why, despite, you know, uh, our incredible knowledge of biology or medicine is still slow to come. And, and one argument is, is that discoveries are made primarily in the academic community, nonprofit community, um, but they're not equipped to turn those discoveries into drugs in general. Um, so drug discovery and development occurs in, in, in the for-profit sector and in, in biotechs and pharma. And, and those two, the nonprofit and for-profit world have very distinct cultures, motivations, infrastructure, and processes. And, and those uh, differences actually slow uh, the translation of new discoveries to new medicines. And so we began to ask the question, can you actually um, seamlessly bridge scientific discovery and drug discovery um, under one roof and, and accelerate the impact uh, directly on patients. In, in many ways, like the old Bell Labs, bridged basic and applied physics to create a huge number of devices that have had a huge impact on society. We'd like to do the same in life sciences. Um, so how do we do that? In general, it, it, it's difficult to build translational capabilities into academic institutions. Uh, so we took a different approach. We, we married translational institutions that already existed and, and were quite effective 
uh, with Scripps as a basic research institution um, to create what I'll call Scripps 2.0. Uh, the two institutions we merged, as Jamie said, are Caliber, which is focused on, on drug discovery and early clinical development, and, and, and the Scripps Research Translational Sciences Institute, which is focused on genomic medicine and, and, and digital medicine. Uh, just as a little background, um, Caliber is a nonprofit institution that was founded in, in 2012. Um, it was merged into Scripps in 2018. Its mission is really to uh, accelerate the development of innovative medicines. Um, uh, Caliber has a wide funding base from foundations, principally the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and now Welcome Trust, as well as federal and state funding and, and, and partnerships with pharma. Uh, Caliber is, is really built extensive preclinical and clinical um, drug discovery infrastructure and expertise, um, which is now part of Scripps. Multiple programs um, across various therapeutic modalities and, and, and diseases. And, and it's a highly collaborative um, uh, institute with collaborations around the world. Just, just as a little bit of background, Caliber has within um, uh, now Scripps, infrastructure for, for protein, creating protein therapeutics, cellular therapeutics, uh, small molecule drug discovery, large libraries and screen technologies, MedChem, uh, pharmacology, safety, and, and more recently, the capability to do IND enabling studies in early clinical trials. Um, the Scripps Research Translational Institute was founded by Eric Topol and really focuses on, on harnessing uh, genomic methodologies, informatics, and digital medicine to better understand human disease at the level of individual patients. And, and for example, two of the major initiatives and in, 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 um, uh, SRTI are, are the Precision Medicine. It's overseeing the Precision Medicine Initiative from the NIH, as well as a newer initiative um, Power Mom, which is really using digital digital um, uh, technologies to create a database to better understand um, those factors um, that impact maternal health outcomes. Um, as I said, um, uh, we have partnerships with with academic laboratories, universities, medical centers, um, pharma and biotech and foundations throughout the world with, with a realization that, that really, you know, tackling human disease now, it, it requires a lot of insights and many different expertises and, and one can't do everything um, oneself. So, so what, are, what are our focal areas? Um, well, we really are tackling um, diseases that, that threaten, you know, the health and healthcare systems uh, of, of the entire global community. Um, our, our focus is really driven by unmet medical need rather than a financial return. We're a nonprofit institution. And, and we can break down um, the diseases that we're working on in three general categories, diseases of aging, uh, heart disease, kidney failure, neurodegeneration, cancer, chronic and childhood diseases, um, type 2 diabetes, obesity, intestinal diseases, and then infectious diseases like HIV, malaria, TB, and, and more recently, COVID. Um, in general, we try to pursue innovative approaches that, that complement pharma and biotech um, with, with some overlap. For example, uh, one area we're focused on is regenerative medicines that, that, that actually reverse disease processes than, than, than rather simply slowing the progression of disease. Harnessing human biology to fight disease, a, a big focus now in, in uh, the development of new medicines. We have a large effort, perhaps the largest in, in repurposed medicines to, to create lower cost medicines for public health. Tissue targeting therapies, um, chemical vaccines, i.e. long lasting drugs that, that you only have to take once every few months and controlled cell therapies. Um, the output to date in terms of, of can we do this 
is, is six programs have advanced into the clinic already out of this effort, two with the Gates Foundation, uh, three scripts um, led research programs where we actually filed the IND and are managing the clinical trial, and then one jointly with Cincinnati Children's Medical Center. Um, we have four programs in IND enabling studies and a robust pipeline of earlier stage programs that we think it's, it's steady state may actually generate two to three INDs a year. Um, this is done um, independently and through through partnerships with with pharma and foundations. But I, I would say, you know, what we've accomplished in in, in the recent past um, in terms of directly going from a research discovery to impacting patients in the clinic is is fairly is really unprecedented for um, a nonprofit research institute. So let me just briefly. Um, overview um, some examples. Um, you'll hear a lot more about um, a number of these programs throughout the day, um, but in, in infectious diseases, um, we've advanced two programs into the clinic, as I said, with the Gates Foundation and TB and childhood diarrhea. And we have um, a, a, a two, two more programs in IND enabling studies in HIV and malaria, as well as HIV vaccines and, and clinical trials. And importantly, um, we're building um, infrastructure that, that um, creates a robust pipeline. So it's self-renewing. So we have a lot of earlier stage programs in infectious disease. But at the same time, we're working on diseases that affect um, the global um, community. Um, as I said, we have four programs in the clinic, uh, regenerative medicine for osteoarthritis, um, uh, two cancer programs, an antifibrotic program, and then uh, two more programs in IND enabling studies that we hope to enter the clinic at the end of this year. And, and again, a robust pipeline behind that that addresses, we think, a large number of, of unmet medical needs. So, so by way of just a few examples, and again, you'll hear more about this throughout the day in the various sessions, but uh, one of our clinical stage programs is, is a cell therapy, CAR T therapy to treat cancers. Um, this is a therapy where, where one um, takes a patient's T cells and genetically engineers those T cells ex vivo um, to target a specific cancer, reintroduces those T cells into the patient. And now that the T cells, the immune system um, is equipped to target the cancer cells um, selectively. This has had, th this therapy um, uh, originated at, 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 at Penn has had remarkable successes with patients. Um, but the big challenge is there are still safety issues around this therapy. Um, uh, it, it's a living drug, so it's difficult to control the expansion and activation of these T cells, which has limited um, the application of this technology to a larger number of cancers, including solid tumors. So, so we've broken down CAR T cell therapy into two pieces, the T cell piece, which we've made a universal CAR T cell, and the activation piece where we actually use a biologic as a tuning knob to, to turn up the T cell activation and turn it down in the end. And we think this will not only uh, increase the safety, um, uh, it creates a universal platform that we think can be applied to, to many different cancers. So we have an ongoing collaboration with AVI. Um, we have we're an ongoing clinical trial in cohort one, dosing patients with the T cells and then the switch molecule. And, and uh, to date in, in humans, the, the, this technology is, is recapitulating what we saw in preclinical studies. And we're working with AVI. To, to, to extend the technology to a range of solid tumors and also creating an allogeneic platform around this technology with a foundation partner. Um, another program is, is a, a bispecific for metastatic prostate cancer. Um, here, the uniqueness of this program is using the imaging agent that's used to selectively image prostate cancer is a targeting agent to target T cells to metastatic prostate cancer. And again, we're in a phase one clinical trial that will have up to 60 patients um, and, and, and uh, currently dosing cohort three. And a 
again with, with very promising results. We're also in an earlier stage have, have a STINK program. This is a program to activate um, uh, the immune system through the STING pathway uh, to fight cancers. Um, uh, we've used structure-based design um, to create a, a, a molecule that activates STING systemically. Uh, we're looking at both oral and, and, and per, uh, parenteral administration. Um, and we expect to declare a, a clinical candidate later this year. But interestingly, well, we've also um, adapted this, this molecule um, to bind alum um, and, and as such, Preclinically, it's starting to show really excellent activity as an adjuvant to improve the efficacy of vaccines. Um, in another area um, that I think we're, we're playing a major role in, in pioneering is, is um, regenerative medicine. Here with drugs that act on endogenous stem cells that we all have in our bodies. Um, uh, as I said, we've looked at it. it at using regenerative approaches to repair cartilage in OA and have, have just completed a phase one trial. Another approach is, is to repair the lung and use endogenous stem cells in our lung to make new lung and reverse lung disease. And we think this could be applicable to a, a large range of pulmonary diseases from, from uh, pulmonary fibrosis, to COPD, and even to acute lung injury from viruses. So what we've done is we've, we've identified molecules that expand uh, human uh, lung stem cells. They're called AEC2 cells. And we've made lung targeted versions of those molecules that have exquisite potency um, in the lung and have uh, very significant efficacy in preclinical, various preclinical models of acute and chronic disease. Importantly, this is a very different mechanism than, than people are, are, are um, pursuing to deal with lung disease. Most, most approaches simply are, are aimed at, in the case of fibrosis, slowing fibrosis. Um, this therapy repairs lung by making new lung. So what we began to see in preclinical models is that this approach is highly synergistic with, with the existing um, uh, uh, standard of care, for example, IPF. So we think this could have a large impact on, on lung disease. And we're hoping to declare a candidate in the next few months and then pursue, pursue this into uh, patients over the next year. Another regenerative medicine we're pursuing is, is uh, uh, we're, we're using, again, a, 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 an existing biological pathway that controls organ size, the hippo yap pathway, making molecules that activate that to, 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 to repair organ damage. One application is skin, okay, and here the goal is, is to uh, uh, reverse and heal diabetic wounds and potentially burns. So we've made small molecule YAP activators that when you, we apply them topically, they actually repair skin, not only in vitro and human uh, keratinocytes, but also in, in relevant animal models. So we're pursuing this now is, is a new therapeutic approach to diabetic wounds, um, which are a big problem. But we're also pursuing a systemic molecule to repair heart and make new cardiomyocytes at the expense of, of fibrosis after heart failure. So we're really excited that, that, that we're moving into an age where we can repair damage simply uh, rather than slow the progression of human disease. We also have programs in, in, in neurodegeneration. One example is, is uh, a GMCSF, uh, uh, antibody fusion. Here the idea is to pursue neuroprotective approaches towards neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's and ALS and Parkinson's. Most of the approaches being pursued today uh, to date are, are, are focused on protein aggregates that are toxic to neuronal cells. This approach um, is exploiting, again, human biology, uh, in, in this case, a form of, of immune cell called a regulatory T cell um, to protect neurons against um, uh, uh, stress. And so we've made a novel antibody GMCSF fusion, okay, that shows excellent um, pharmacology and animal models. 
Uh, we're moving this into the clinic. Um, we hope to file an IND in, in, at the end of this year. And, and our enthusiasm for this program is, is based on a lot of preclinical work with regulatory T cells and neurodegenerative disease, as well as some, uh, some, some investigator-led clinical trials that are showing that upregulating regulatory T cells um, is having an impact on Parkinson's patients, Alzheimer's patients, and, and patients with Lou Gehrig's disease. So, so based on that, we, we hope that this will have a, a very significant uh, uh, impact on neurodegenerative disease as a new approach. We have funding from the Michael J. Fox Foundation to move this forward. There's also a potential opportunity for Tregs and, and a long-acting GMCSF and cancer. Uh, recent studies have shown that, that upregulating Tregs with, with um, uh, GMCSF actually um, uh, lowers the, 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 the significant adverse effects uh, associated with checkpoint therapy and actually improves overall survival. So this therapy could actually also have an impact on, on one of the most exciting uh, cancer therapies currently being pursued. Earlier stage programs were um, uh, trying to harness natural um, cellular recycling systems, uh, autophagy, um, to remove toxic protein aggregates and organelles in the cells. Um, we've done a novel uh, lipid uh, uh, screen, oil droplet screen that has identified molecules that actually already have uh, the ability to clear protein aggregates and, and axons of primary neurons. So we're really excited about moving this forward. Another endogenous uh, uh, protective system we're trying to exploit is what's called the antioxidant response element. Uh, this is a way cells react to cellular stress to upregulate a bunch of defensive um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, if you can activate this with a benign small molecule, you can protect organs from damage ranging from, from the brain to the eye to the kidney. Uh, the challenge here is most uh, molecules that activate this pathway are them in themselves damaging, <laughs> okay? Um, the furthest along is bardoxolone, which is showing very good efficacy in, in kidney failure, but also safety concerns. So we've made a small molecule that we think is far more selective in activating antioxidant response element. We're pursuing that as well, uh, again, to protect um, uh, from age-related degeneration. Uh, we have a large collaboration with the Gates Foundation and in Infectious Disease. Um, and uh, now that's been expanded by a collaboration with the Wellcome Trust. Uh, one of the, the pro, uh, uh, efforts that it has come out of that is what I'll call an HIV chemical vaccine. This is a realization that it, it, it's been hard to make neutralizing antibodies um, uh, uh, vaccines against HIV. But there are some very potent small molecules that are used in the treatment of HIV. And we've, been, we've managed to make these in the molecules that, that look like an injection once every four to six months, a single injection, will be we can use to either treat or protect against HIV. So it, it's not a once a year flu shot, but it, it's a once every at twice a year to three times a year protective chemical vaccine against HIV. And this, we're looking at, 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 at an, uh, we're, we're in IND enabling studies and looking to initiate a phase one trial um, late this year, or early next year. So again, this is a, a, could have a huge impact on, on HIV. We're also working on other diseases uh, infectious diseases, um, especially those that are neglected. TB kills roughly one and a half million people every year, and a huge fraction of the world's population is infected. Uh, it, it, the problem with treating TB is the therapies tend to be long, um, and there's a, the, the possibility of drug resistance if you discontinue the therapy too early. So people are looking at combinations of drugs and, and effective, more effective combinations of drugs. So we entered into a collaboration with Cornell and looked at, at killing TB within its, its human host cell, the macrophage, and found the novel activity of small molecules that, that, that um, modulate cholesterol catabolism. 
And surprisingly, these molecules by themselves don't show much activity, but when used um, with, with two existing um, TB drugs uh, are actually sterilizing um, in, in animal models of disease. So there's a lot of excitement about this. Uh, and this is moving forward with the Gates Medical Research Institute. We also are looking at an, another novel approach towards dealing with infectious diseases. And that, that's not necessarily to, to target the pathogen itself, but the vector that carries the pathogen. So for instance, can you develop a drug that we take, but every time a mosquito bites us, it dies. And, and it's been modeled that, that, you know, if you have a drug with a long enough half-life that you can block 20, 90% of the transmission of, for example, malaria. So we're working on this with the Gates Foundation, but the, the other thing we realized is, is you can also kill um, vectors that, that carry disease before they transmit the disease, okay? For instance, um, you can kill ticks. So we're working on an oral drug that you would take if you wanna go on a, a week long hike in New Hampshire, you take a pill before you go hiking and um, the ticks die um, once they bite you before they actually um, infect you um, with Lyme disease. So an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And we think this could be a really exciting approach towards dealing with Lyme disease, but also other diseases that are borne by, by scabies, mites, mosquitoes, and other vectors. Uh, as I said, we have a large um, structure-based vaccine initiative. Uh, we're looking at making uh, vaccines that create neutralizing antibodies uh, against HIV, against influenza, and more recently against COVID, probably the largest structure-based vaccine um, design group um, in, in, in the nonprofit world. And we have uh, uh, vaccines um, and antibodies in phase one clinical trials. Uh, we've also uh, have a large focus on repurposed medicines. Um, in collaboration with the Gates Foundation, we built the largest collection of repurposed drugs, 14,000 drugs that have been either put into people or late stage preclinical. And we're now screening these drugs for new activities. Um, repurposed medicines have, have actually had a big impact on, on public health. Uh, AZT for HIV and thalidomide for multiple myeloma. Um, the advantage of repurposed medicines, if you find a new uh, opportunity for a known drug, is you can move incredibly quickly into the clinic because we know a lot about the safety um, and, and pharmacology of these drugs. So we built this collection. One example is we started a, a, a program around cryptosporidium with one postdoc and two and a half years later, we were dosing patients with a repurposed medicine. Um, we've distributed this, this collection to over a hundred labs around the world um, uh, at no cost and, and now have more than a dozen repurposing opportunities in infectious disease, immunology, cancer, biology, and others. So, so the, the other advantage of this is it promises to lower the cost of medicines. Um, we've used this when COVID um, uh, raised its ugly head. We actually um, were well poised to send this collection to over 30 labs around the world um, where they, it was screened to look for new antivirals against COVID. We have a number of those that are now in animal models of, of, of COVID, but we've also um, at the same time uh, identified active compounds that I would say are, are the basis for late stage lead optimizations to take drugs that work uh, uh, somewhat against COVID and make them into good drugs against um, uh, COVID-19 and other coronaviruses. Um, for example, we now have a, a, a protease inhibitor that targets the main protease in, in, in SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it's roughly 25 times more potent than any protease inhibitor that's been reported and also has good pharmacology. We think this could, in combination with the polymerase inhibitors like remdesivir, uh, uh, significantly improve the efficacy of drugs and drug combinations for not only the treatment of COVID, for, but also prophylaxic uh, use. The beauty of MPRO is, is, is it's conserved across other coronises, 
viruses. So we see activity of, of this protease inhibitor with MERS and, and SARS-1. So, so we think as we think about pandemic preparedness, these kinds of approaches will play major, major roles in the future. So, so Scripps actually has a, a fairly comprehensive uh, 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 set of programs around COVID-19 COVID is, is the pandemic came up. I think we responded actually um, uh, really well, not only at Scripps, but the entire scientific community came together, um, nonprofit and for-profit. And across all of the, the various uh, needed um, uh, strategies to fight um, coronaviruses, including monitoring and tracing viral spread, um, using genomics tools, preventing. Um, we saw the structure, the, the corona spike protein that was used in the design of, of, of the vaccines, um, identified antibodies against COVID-19, and as I said, um, the largest repurposed screening effort um, uh, globally. I think what you'll hear about in, in, in a session after lunch is, is what did we learn from, from what have we learned from uh, 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 SARS, uh, um, sorry, sorry, what have we learned from, from, from this pandemic, COVID-19, and, and, and what lessons um, can we apply to future pandemics, um, which are very likely um, to, to happen. So just in summary, um, I think we've made a lot of progress in, 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 in showing that an institute can not only do basic, outstanding basic research, that's historically what Scripps research has been, but also can, can begin to play a very significant role in the translation of, of that research to new drugs that, that actually directly impact patients where you go from the bench all the way to the patient's bedside. And I think given our success to date, we believe that this can be scaled um, significantly to have an even bigger impact. And one direction we'd really like to scale is, is creating more infrastructure and expertise to, to, to move the molecules in the pipeline we built into the clinic so we can actually evaluate those, those molecules um, and their direct impact on human disease. And, and so we're looking at various mechanisms. Most of our effort there has been funded opportunistically in the past, but we're looking for more robust mechanisms and strategies to fund, to fund the early stage clinical trials as we, we go forward. So in summary, um, I think we've shown that, that nonprofit research institutes um, can both do breakthrough um, science, technology development, and accelerate the impact of, of those scientific discoveries uh, on public health. Um, Scripps is, is somewhat unique. It, it's a highly entrepreneurial um, institution. And so we, we have a history of investing resources in high risk, high reward uh, opportunities to advance, not only science, but, but now medicine. And in and, and doing so, in investing, you know, federal dollars, philanthropic dollars, and, and other revenues in the development of new medicines, you actually have the opportunity to amplify the impact of, of those research dollars, not only on, on human health, but also by creating new medicines, um, you create not only public health value, but financial value as well. And that financial value can be reinvested in the research enterprise to, as I say, not only make it self-sustaining, but to grow. So I think that's another unique aspect of the model we're trying to build. And finally, I'd like to thank you um, uh, for all of your enthusiasm and for your support over the years. Um, clearly, um, that support is what makes our work possible. And uh, we're, uh, we want to all thank you for, for that support. Happy to, uh, I think we have five or 10 minutes left to answer any questions. Uh, thank, thanks, Pete. Thanks for that uh, sweeping overview. Uh, I'd like to encourage everyone to uh, type in any questions that you might have, and we can field them in the few minutes that we have before the next session. Um, maybe, maybe I'll ask 
one for you, Pete. Uh, you know, I think you, you made a really great point about how Scripps uh, responded very rapidly to the arrival of, of COVID-19. And I think in part that was due to the extensive expertise and ongoing efforts for people with uh, for HIV and for flu over many, many decades. But, you know, did we organize that? How did we organize that response? And how could we do that better so that we could spin up and, and what kind of resources would be useful to, uh, to be able to do that? That's a good question, Jamie. I think that's probably one of the first questions I was gonna ask the pandemic preparedness panel <laughs> after Trevor's talk. Yep. But I, I think the take home lesson of COVID-19, uh, you know, some positive things came out of that. And one is, is it really brought together the entire research community, okay, and all of the, the expertise of the community. A lot of people were working on various different projects, but, but turned their experience and expertise to COVID-19 and actually created a pretty cohesive and, and encompassing global response. Now, now the question is, how, how to organize that, you know, how to organize academic centers and, and, and pharmaceutical centers, biotech to, to collaborate better and how to provide resources better and, and, and organize all of those efforts. And I think that's, that's the beauty is, is, is what we saw was a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and effort. I think your point of being able to better organize that effort and that enthusiasm into, into a more productive outcomes is, is a, a great topic uh, for conversation as we move forward. But the take home lesson there is you to do the same thing, establish really powerful partnerships and in cancer and in other infectious diseases of the developing world, diseases of aging and others. So, so I think there are some, some really positives that came out of this. Right. Uh, I would just reflect on uh, one of the previous uh, pandemics, which was HIV. And I, I was a graduate student in the, in the mid 1980s when that came around. So we're still trying to understand how HIV works and how it, we still don't have a vaccine for it that's, that's very effective. And so what, what do you think is the, you know, the future for coronavirus research and in in becoming a, you know, a modern paradigm for virus? Well, I think, you know, that's an interesting question. I think we have the tools to deal with it. We just, as a society, have to, to make a commitment to dealing with it, okay? We, we, we've spent trillions of dollars preparing for wars, some of which haven't happened, okay? But we just had a war with a little virus that we didn't do so well in, right? And, and certainly there are gonna be additional viral threats in the future, almost without doubt. So what we need to do as a society is think, you know, th th there's just not global military threats, okay? There are global threats from the natural world that we really need to devote resources to and organize ourselves at a higher level to deal with. But I think the good news is, is, is there's a huge amount of knowledge in science and a huge amount of enthusiasm and commitment to do this. So I, I think once we make the decision to, to really, you know, think about viruses like we think about military conflict, that, that we'll be incredibly successful in preparing for these. Right. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's probably a short list, uh, you, you alluded to this, but there, there's a short list of other known viruses uh, that, that we should be paying attention to. And it's, it almost seems like we, we should really suit up to, uh, to you know, develop vaccines for those viruses before they even uh, reach the well, Yeah, no, and, and I think you'll hear from, from Trevor that, that, that the foundation has spent you know, time thinking about what are the, the most likely next pandemic threats. But, you know, the, the, the challenge is, is, you know, we have COVID-19, but we have an aging population and there's a huge number of diseases that face our aging population and chronic diseases that are just destroying our healthcare systems, okay, and economies. 
And, and so uh, people shouldn't forget that, that COVID is just one example of what can be done when we put our minds to really, you know, tackling these major diseases with, with the right level of resources and the right interaction between the, the talents, infrastructure, and expertise is a, of the nonprofit and, 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 and commercial um, life science communities. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Pete. That was a, a great sweeping overview. I think we're gonna touch on all of those themes 